Welcome to a brand new episode on Front Row on Economy.lk. Uh, we're indeed privileged to have with us the Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Dr. Indrajit Kumar Swami. Welcome, sir, to this uh, program. Thank you. Um, doctor, if, if I was to ask you, um, we, keep, we just got elevated towards the upper middle income status. A lot has been talked about it. Uh, but the perennial problem is trying to avoid being stuck in this. Uh, and it's coined famously as the middle income trap. What are some of the steps that, uh, based on some of the other countries who've gone beyond this to 8,000 to even 12,000 per capita and beyond, uh, what can we learn from them given our population, given, given the market size and uh, given some of the inherent strengths that we do have as well? I guess it's good to start with uh, trying to understand what exactly the middle income trap means. Uh, it essentially entails a country having its wage levels go up to the point where it can no longer competitive, no longer be competitive vis-a-vis -vis low income countries for low, low tech activity. But at the same time, uh, the country concerned doesn't have a sufficiently well developed um, level of, of competitiveness or productivity of innovation to compete with the higher income countries. So they are sort of in limbo, stuck in the middle. So the only way to get out of this is essentially to make sure that you drive innovation, competitiveness, etc. So that's the kind of broad point to make in terms of the definition and you know what one needs to do to get out. But in, in terms of the specifics as to how one uh, addresses that, clearly you know you have I have this fixation about macro fundamentals. I mean without that you, you don't get anything. So first you have to make sure that your macroeconomic uh, fundamentals are sound, that your macroeconomic uh, policy formulation has clear frameworks which is which we are beginning to put in place then you need to look at really that factor markets uh, look at your education training and skills development your business climate your investment promotion trade facilitation trade policy all that you need to bring together really because what you are trying to do is to really raise the overall level of the competitiveness of the economy uh, so that you're able to ideally have more complex uh, production even more ideally complex export production and you're creating higher value employment so that's really the the root out of the the, the, the middle income trap so one thing that will really um, be a, st a stalling point in this is these are perennial boom and bust cycles that we've seen over the last uh, few decades um, a are we still in that cycle, in your opinion, in terms of uh, how it is sort of linking in with some of the electoral cycles that we usually see every five years? And B, what do we need to really break free from it? Because it's, it's something that's really dragging down on overall growth and even business activity and things like that. Sure. So the root cause is the government's fiscal operations. If you look back at the last 30, 40 years, uh, we've consistently um, had fiscal instability. And particularly, you know, it kind of tends to coincide with the electoral cycle. Uh, and uh, if you caricaturize the Sri Lanka economy, it's a high budget deficit, high inflation, high nominal interest rate, overvalued currency economy. That's basically what we've been. Um, and so this boom and bust cycle comes in when, you know, before an election, you have a populist package, the economy overheats. Then you go to the IMF, we have had something like 16 or 17 programs. I don't know of any other country which has had more programs. So then you have the stabilization and then you, you know, uh, you have restrictive policies, growth tends to, uh, to decline. Uh, and then you have, again, as the electoral cycle finishes, you again have these, you loosen policies, you have excess aggregate demand and you go through the whole cycle again. Now, there are some signs that we are beginning to break out of it. Why do I say that? Because since 1954, there have been only three years when there has been a primary surplus in the budget. And two of those three years were 2017 and 2018. So there seems to be a structural improvement. Now this year, is, 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 it's a bit difficult to get a handle on this year because the April events have seriously disturbed the government's revenue collection. So it's going to be a kind of a, a year that is that is unusual, and, and probably one needs to, um, you know, factor it out. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we've gone backwards, uh, because there are exogenous factors beyond the control of the authorities. But um, 
that because of the Indian Revenue Act, because of the VAT reforms, because of the improvements that are being made in terms of tax administration, there seems to be a structural improvement in the budget. If we can keep, uh, even this year, despite the very large shortfall in revenue that is being foreseen now, due to factors beyond the government's control, um, uh, there, there may well be a small primary surplus. So that is a qualitative change. So in answer to your question, are we breaking out of it? It's probably too early to tell, but there seem to be grounds for very cautious optimism. Sure. And just one point on that, something that you've been talking about in the last few months is on this Monetary Law Act and, thing, and, and the provisions that will sort of maybe enable us to even break away from it. Um, just for the public's uh, understanding, what exactly would uh, such a piece of legislation do, okay. consider, uh, considering where we're at now? Sure. So, you know, historically we've had fiscal forbearance in monetary policy formulation. Essentially, whenever the government needed it, they used to, you know, make the central bank take on treasury bills. I mean, effectively print money. Uh, that is probably the worst thing a central bank can do because it fuels inflation. Some of that uh, leaks into imports, puts pressure on the balance of payments. It can cause asset bubbles. So it is a <laughs> you know, unreservedly bad thing to do. Um, so that's one thing that's being addressed. So what, what are the new things in the Monetary Law Act? One is we have already um, implemented a flexible inflation targeting regime. That has been in place, you know, gradually we put in place over the last five, six years. This is not something that happened, you know, a day or two ago. In fact, uh, Governor Cabral set up a committee about seven years ago to study this. Since that time, we have gradually been putting it into place, strengthening our, our modeling and forecasting capabilities, uh, making sure that uh, our, our communication is also kind of uh, geared uh, to a flexible inflation targeting regime and so if if the new monetary law comes into place as far as uh, monetary policy is concerned nothing will change because already we are in a flexible inflation targeting regime so the question to ask then is you know why do you need to put this into the law uh, if you are anyway implementing it the reason for that is one of the major criticisms of the policy framework in Sri Lanka is a lack of predictability and consistency. And also given our exposure to rating agencies and capital markets and our, our external debt dynamics, we want to give a clear signal uh, to our investors, to our lenders, uh, that monetary policy is going to be formulated independently. And so therefore we are embedding the flexible inflation targeting regime so people know what the regime is. And for independence, we are changing the governance structure so that the Secretary of the Treasury, who has historically been a member of the Monetary Board, will no longer be a member. Uh, another reason, it, one is to have a clear separation of monetary and fiscal policy. Two is, when the Monetary Law Act was written, the Secretary of Treasury, you know, we used to have permanent secretaries. The Secretary of Treasury was not a, a political appointee like every other secretary is now. So we don't think it's a good thing to have a political appointed person in the governance structure. Now, the new law proposes that even the governor, everybody within the governance structure of the central bank should be nominated by the finance minister and appointed by the president in concurrence with the constitutional council. Now, in my view, um, two things. You need an independent Supreme Court for a good, healthy society and you need uh, an independent central bank for a healthy economy. So these are two things that you need to do and you need to depoliticize them as much as possible. So, th so it, it embeds the um, flexible inflation targeting regime uh, in the new law uh, so that it's clear to everybody what the framework is. Then we are separating monetary policy and fiscal policy. However, there will be a coordinating council chaired by the finance minister where the governor would also be sitting in it and the ST. So there will be a forum for regular communication to make sure that there is good fiscal monetary coordination. Because you can't run a flexible inflation targeting regime without good 
uh, fiscal monetary coordination. So that will give you that. And as I said, the, as far as printing of money is concerned, the bylaw, the central bank will not be allowed to participate in the primary auctions. Of course, we will uh, we'll conduct open market operations. I see sometimes in the media there's a bit of confusion uh, between our operations in the secondary market, uh, which I think all central banks do to calibrate the level of liquidity in the system. But we won't be able to print money, i.e. we won't be able to operate in the primary auction uh, in, in future. And with that, we'll bring this uh, discussion, um, a rich discussion to a close with the governor talking about uh, the middle income trap, uh, one of the key issues which has been the boom and bust cycle, and one key particular reform item on the agenda, uh, which is in the process of implementation, which is the Monetary Law Act. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, uh, no Dr. problem. Dr. Thank for you for having us me. On Thank you. Thank you. Stay tuned for future videos like this where we talk with eminent personalities.